set up here with uh, Cliff Atkinson. Uh, as background, Cliff Atkinson here is a, uh, he wrote a book called Beyond Bullet Points. I don't know if anybody's read it, I read it. It's uh, a really, really great book, kind of one of the defining moments in, you know, you've all heard before, you know, don't use bullet points in your PowerPoint. And for certain of those presentations didn't have them. Um, and not that you take all the credit for that book, but he came up with a, a really great sort of storyboarding format for presenting. It's been a many times bestseller from uh, Microsoft Publishing. Um, and uh, he is going to give a wonderful presentation today uh, about kind of psychology and all these different sides of, of information overload. So I will let you take over. Yeah. Oh, it's, I've been, uh, this book, Young Bullet Points, came out in about 2005. And uh, so I've been working in PowerPoint for quite a bit of time, working in corporations, working with trial attorneys. So I'll talk a little bit about that. But I thought I'd get up to date with uh, the latest on how we're doing in PowerPoint. So I thought I'd go to Google and uh, Google the term bad PowerPoint and see what came <laughs> out. And I don't know if you've seen many of these slides before <coughs> at any conferences. But then I, I, I'm a glutton for punishment, so I thought I'd type in worst PowerPoint <laughs> and got these slides. You want to answer my question? Uh, yeah, actually, that'd be great. And I know that this, this is one of the award winners. This actually made the front page of the New York Times uh, about two years ago. And I'm, and I'm curious, so if you're an audience member and you're about to experience this, how do you feel? Information overload. This, this is overload, so we don't need any research to, to, to tell us how we feel about this, right? So overload, what else? Particularly emotions. What emotions? And how does that make you feel? Itchy. What's that? Itchy. Itchy, itchy. That's interesting. I've never heard that before. Itchy. That is an itchy pattern, I think. <laughs> how, how else does that make you feel? Grasping for patterns. Okay, so you're grasping for patterns. Uh, I heard a confused. Angry. Angry. Right. Interesting. Angry, there's, there's interested, interested to find out what, what is the spaghetti, right? <laughs> or, or what's the no, matter? I'm, I'm interested in... It's intriguing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, okay. And then the angry, who said angry? So why does it make you feel? Because I think the presenter is an idiot. Okay, because? Because it's, it's uh, nearly impossible to read. Yep. Uh, it's pretty much incomprehensible. Yep. Uh, and I would think that the presenter is really spending enough time to, uh, didn't spend enough time preparing yep. uh, to earn my attention. Okay, great. Um, one more? Yep. So, so, well, actually, a little bit different. Yep. If this is yeah, out of context, maybe do some of these feelings, but, you know, if a whole bunch of slides had previously shown some of the individual things, yep. and this allowed me to, to have a nonlinear understanding of what was a linear presentation, yep then this may have just gelled, oh, I see how all those things I did before are connected, yep. that I would, that, so there's a context. So there was like well, a, a build to this. You might be trying to convey yeah. that it's really complicated. Yeah, so that, that could convey that message of complex and overwhelming, uh, and then you, you proceed to simplify it, or the other way around, and perhaps it was a build, where you went through each of these elements, and it was teaching each of these pieces, and then this is the final build, so that, that's possible as well. This was actually the, the winner of a contest for worst PowerPoint slide. And what was interesting about it is it actually had this little button on the corner, mouse over the image. Like if you mouse it over, it's gonna make it easier to understand. Um, so, so this is really just an apply. This is gonna be a different angle for a lot of things we've been talking about today, but really an applied way that, especially from the, you know, we're, we're gonna be talking today about the user side being overwhelmed as a, for example, an audience member. But then also as a presenter side, the person who's generating content of various sorts. So today will be more of the focus if you're the generator of the content. And so if there's one thing that I, I would recommend, you know, the one takeaway I would say for what we can do, it would be this phrase, to, to thread the needle with a pyramid. So that would be the central message today, what we can do to solve that problem of information overload uh, in communicating uh, information. So let me start out then with with the needle, what exactly is the needle? Um, and, I, and I do like to start out with, with the research and doing a quick survey of all the research that was done by Microsoft. 
back when they first they first acquired PowerPoint from another company. And then uh, this was the research they did at the very beginning to show that using bullet points was more effective than any other way of communicating information. And all the research that said using the templated format um, and standard backgrounds is better than any other form of communication. So let's take a quick look at all the research that they did way back then. Actually, you're looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> any research conducted that shows that the default way that we use the tool is any better than any other way. So we're just doing it the way we're doing it just because we're doing it. And I don't know in other areas of information overload that might apply to as well. But that's basically why we're doing it. But the good news is that there is a, there is a, a body of research that is specifically relevant. Uh, there's somebody named uh, Richard Mayer. And we're, I was curious, uh, Donna, do you know Richard Mayer UC Santa Barbara? Do you know? Okay. So he's a great guy. I went down to visit him one time. He's the, he's the most prolific researcher in the field of educational psychology. So he's been studying for 25 years how it is that people learn most effectively using words and pictures. So it's not just focused on PowerPoint, but about multimedia communication, the presentation of information. And one of the things in, in that book, the Cambridge Handbook of Multimedia Learning, that he talks about is this core assumption that we have about how it is that people communicate, that we communicate with one another. So this is the default assumption that we have without even thinking, uh, thinking whether we do it or don't do it. And it's basically the sender-receiver model. So it's the idea uh, of basically if I want to communicate to somebody else, there's almost like a pipeline that I can use to communicate that information to you. So for example, if I want to um, communicate something, I can just basically put together a deck, power, a set of PowerPoint slides, However I like, because I'm creating it, I can put whatever I like in it, uh, whatever you know, uh, templates I want to use, whatever number of bullet points, and then I will give that to you, and there you got it. And if you didn't get it, it's your fault, because I gave it to you, there it is. Uh, so one of the things he says that you can actually have three possible outcome, learning outcomes in a situation like this. The first one he, he calls uh, meet, uh, no learning. So you gave that PowerPoint, but in a measurable sense, you know, in, in using measurement, no learning happened whatsoever. The second possible outcome he calls fragmented learning. That you do measures and then afterwards, uh, they, they remember a couple of those bullet points, maybe a chart that's like 23, some fragments of information. And then the third kind of outcome he calls meaningful learning. That what you intended before you presented actually measurably happened in terms of learning on the other side. So pretty much we tend to be in a state these days of fragmented uh, learning in terms of PowerPoint. And here, here's a reason why. It really has to do with this shape of our assumption about how people learn. And so to start to, to engage the, the situation, we really need to change our own assumption about the shape of how people learn. Away from that pipeline idea to something that looks more like this. So in the, the preface to that, uh, to that book, Dr. Mayer describes three types of human memory. The first type is uh, called sensory memory. And that's basically just our capacity just to scan this environment and take in a potentially unlimited amount of information just by scanning and listening. The second type of, uh, of memory, long-term memory, obviously where we want our audiences to hold on to that information, uh, that's also potentially unlimited in its capacity. But between those two, there's actually a third type of memory called working memory, which is very different from those other two. So where those other two are potentially unlimited in capacity, working memory is severely constrained in its capacity. Uh, some studies, the classic studies in the 50s say that it's you know, number five plus or minus two um, chunks of information that we can hold in working memory at any one time. Uh, some more contemporary memory researchers say it's maybe three to four chunks of information. So really, this is the, the huge challenge that we face as communicators in whatever medium we use, is that we've got a lot of information that we would love to communicate to our audiences, and we would, we would like all of that to end up as we presented it, like in that original assumption, just the way we presented it, 
But the big problem we face is the eye of the needle. This limited capacity of humans to be able to process new information. It's just completely limited. And so what tends to happen is that when we're showing that deck the way that we created any way that we liked, we can so easily overwhelm working memory. So working memory is just grabbing bits and pieces of them from that present of information, and then it's resulting in the fragmented learning. So um, if we ignore the idea of that we have to respect the limits of working memory, then the, the structure for presenting information um, can actually work against that. So for example, in this classic way of, of uh, laying out a slide, we've got a, a generic heading at the top that doesn't really convey a lot of information, just says focus areas. Well, what about focus areas? I don't know, so I'm going to have to start working to start reading all of these bullets which have equal, equal uh, hierarchical value. And at the bottom, it looks like something's in red. So what's, and at the same time that all this is going on, then somebody's speaking. So we, we are actually using the tool generally in a way that's working against uh, clear communication. And so it's leading to you know, our audiences being confused and easily overwhelmed by information. A second um, research principle is that we have to guide attention. Uh, and so what a, a model for, for doing that uh, goes along the lines of a, a newspaper headline. So when you scan a newspaper, at the very top, you've got the, the key information. And then in this slide, then there's a simple graphic that illustrates that point. And then there's the person who's speaking. So I'll show some examples of how that might work in a live presentation environment. Um, the third research principle is basically that it's called dual processing. That we've got two streams of information uh, in a multimedia presentation, the visual channel and the verbal channel. And so what, what does tend to happen in our conventional way of using PowerPoint is that we're putting everything in the visual channel, uh, including what the information <coughs> that we want to communicate, but then also we're reading the same information as well. So one of the, the big fixes and one of the ways that organizations are starting to address that is to use the notes page view within PowerPoint to present uh, the visual information on the slide area, and then what is listened to goes into that notes page area. So this is a way then to, to solve the problem if, if you know, many organizations are not going to give up the PowerPoint. This is a way that it gives them the capacity to use the same tool to both create slides that work in a, uh, in a presentation environment, but then also for people who are not there, then you can provide that handout in a PDF format as well. So as we might start to look at these different ways of using PowerPoint, uh, we're actually getting into the structure beneath the slides and distilling down the information to what's most important. And as we can do that, then we're really easing the passage of that information through that eye of the needle. So, so that's the, the basic needle concept. And so now let's look at, at some practical ways that presentations can be structured in order to thread that needle. The primary way that I recommend, especially at the start of a presentation, is to use a story structure. So one of the great um, resources for this are people who tell visual stories in Hollywood and uh, in, in television and film. This, is, this book uh, by Robert McKee is an excellent uh, introduction to story. But if we're going to just look at the elements of story, what, what are some of the elements of story? What does every story have? Plot. Characters. Characters. Beginning, middle, and end. Beginning, middle, and end. Conflict. Conflict. And how about setting at the very beginning? So these are all the, the fundamental pieces of story structure. And so one of the ways then to work with those is to actually create, this is a, a, a PDF that I, I give out during workshops just to be able to start to map out and storyboard the beginning of a presentation. So one of the ways I, I show how this works is just to map this back to, uh, to Hollywood movies to show how those classic elements are, are there in any movie, including one like uh, and, uh, Avatar. 
Uh, so the first piece, let's say we're going to go see Avatar that was <coughs> set in a land far, far away. And uh, the, the leading character was this guy named Jake. And Jake faced a problem. What was Jake's problem at the beginning of the movie? He was in a wheelchair. Exactly. And so if he's in a wheelchair, that's his point A, and he wants to be at point B, what's his point B? What does he want? To walk. He wants to walk. So this is you know, the beginning of the setting. We've got our main character. He's facing a challenge at point A. He wants to be at point B. How is he going to get from point A to point B? Become an avatar. And then that picks off the action in the movie. Which basically, if you didn't see it, you know, he goes and, and goes undercover as an avatar, and then he, uh, then there's a twist in the movie where he falls in love with uh, with another character, and then finally the people who hired him don't like that, so then they get into a big fight. So that in a single page is that story structure. Uh, but essentially, this is another another uh, it's a word document that basically does the same thing. It's basically saying at the beginning of any presentation, especially non-fiction presentations that we're really getting into the, 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 the shoes of our audiences and making them the main character and then <coughs> presenting them with a problem that they face. So it's a, a basic, basically a solution, a problem-solution structure. So they're facing a problem at point A, they want to be at point B, how do they get there? That becomes the story thread, which we use to focus the story. So what's happening, I guess from an informational perspective as well, is that with all, all the potential information we could present, we're really running it through the emotional core, really the heart of the audience, and saying, what do they care about? What's the emotional connection here? And so uh, an example of that, let me share with you a, a story of a $253 million PowerPoint presentation. Um, after, a couple months after my book came out, I got a call. I'd written it for a business audience, but a lawyer gave me a call and said, hey, I've got a big case coming up. I'm representing a, a woman whose husband had died after taking this painkiller called Biox. And so uh, he said, yeah, I read your book, and I like what you say about the story. Will you come out and help me to create an opening statement? And I told him I'd never been in a courtroom before. And he said, that's OK. Come on down. Let, let's give this a try. So we created the, the opening using the, the, the uh, structure in, in the book, uh, using that essential story structure. And the, the next day, we had a lot of national press there covering the case. They wrote about the presentations themselves and how dramatically better the, the, his presentations were than the other side. And how the whole experience was frighteningly powerful, how image and story and all, all these things came together in, in this case. So just to show a couple of slides of how this all came together, uh, a lawyer was standing right at the jury box. There was a big 10-foot screen behind him. So when he's presenting, it's almost like he's in front of a giant television set or a theatrical backdrop. So then he starts off introducing them to, you know, like to introduce you to Carol, who's over here uh, in, in, the, uh, in the audience. And uh, she was single, late in life, you know, so was Bob. And her daughter introduced her to Bob on a blind date, and they hit it off. And they went on bike rides together, and they fell in love, and pretty soon they got married. And they were happily married together for 11 months until something happened that changed everything forever. Bob died of a heart attack, leaving a hole in Carol's heart. So if you've ever been in a courtroom, normally these, these opening statements are really dry, and they're just you know, going through all the legal terminology and like just going through document after document. But here, we're telling a story. And here, in this particular case, he's presenting to a very conservative jury in East Texas. He's not about to give a big verdict for a product liability case like this, so he's shifting the story now from that kind of case into a chalk outline. And you and the jury get to be like CSI detectives. You get to sort through all the evidence and figure out what killed Bob. We're going to show you a mountain of evidence that leads to the front steps of a pharmaceutical company that produced a painkiller that they knew increased the risk of heart attacks. But they didn't tell Bob. They didn't tell his doctor. He took the pill and he died of a heart attack. You're going to be able to get into all the evidence, but ultimately it's going to be up to you to find justice for Mrs. Ernst. And you can do that by following the three parts of this case. It's a case about a company that had motive, a company that had means, 
how the motive and means come together to kill Bob Rose. So this singular slaughter. So talk about information overload. We had over, we had over six million documents. This was a hugely complex case. But in, in the whole introduction to this, we're keeping it very simple. CSI, I, I get that, I've heard of that reference before. And now cognitively, one, two, three. It's cognitively accessible. There's a framework. There's something I can hold on to. I have a, a favorite saying uh, when I'm working with lawyers is that a confused mind always says no. So in this case, it's very easy to understand so that it's easier for them to say yes. So in this particular case, using the same, for this nonfiction presentation, the setting was, uh, the, the, the outline and the role is making the jurors, the, the CSI detectives, their point A, mountain of evidence, where you want to be, I want to find justice, and how do I do that, all the three parts of the case. So for any uh, body of information, or this is another view of the same information, uh, in, the, in the word version of this, but just basically uh, finding at the beginning of the story the, the singular story thread that's going to focus of the information that's going to come next. So that's threading the needle. And then lastly, uh, which I think is, is really the, the, it's the, the intellectual engine under the hood of, of this approach, is, is the pyramid piece of this. So what we did in this, this is called a story, again, that story template I mentioned. Um, but we, we start out with, the, you know, here's the three parts of the case. And then when I, when I go work with these attorneys or work on presentations with folks, then the, this, this, this huge piece right here is if your audience walks out remembering three things, what are those three things? Or in this case, you know, what if, you, if the jurors walk out and they, somebody asks them, what was that case about? And they said, oh, it was about this company that knew about this drug and they had the, the motive and the means and they killed this guy. Then that's success for that attorney because it's really connecting that emotional level. But then here, the motive, the means, and the, and the motive and means kill Bob all become the, the three anchor points. So this applies to any kind of presentation. You know, if there are any, any information to present, it's about what, what are those three most important things. And this, you know, I can't overstate how important this can be in really providing those anchor points, the cognitive framework, and the anchors for somebody to be able to hold on to the information. So in this case, we're actually then structuring the information around those three anchors. So in that first case, well, how did they have motive? Then we start working from left to right. Well, they turned the company into an ATM with a new uh, CEO who's a businessman instead of a scientist. Uh, their pipeline was uh, running low in patents, and so they're running out of cash. And so they went all in on this untested product. Then if we were to go to the next level, then all the evidence goes over to the right. So this is, this is simply a classic logic tree structure. So this is the pyramid that is so crucial to organizing information and distilling it down to its essence. So what it does is say, well, if you know, we've got the singular element, uh, the thread of the story, and then if they just remember three things, those are what those three things are, and then, then we go into more detail from left to right. Yep. Oops, five minutes, okay. Um, so then those became the anchors in this case, you know, the one, the two, and the three so that the jurors would be able to hold on to that information. And then the slides were, as I mentioned before in the, the Intel example, they work like this, where you can read the, the main point, see the graphic, and then their attention focuses here, where it's usually very diffuse, and, you know, and, and a lot of information there. Now it's very clear, and this is more of a, as I mentioned, a, a backdrop that's helping to tell the story. So what happened in that case? So after he gave his opening, then the other side went, literally a gray PowerPoint template. It started off saying, you know, we're a wonderful company and look at all the wonderful things we've done. Here's pictures of our CEO. <laughs> are, aren't we great? <laughs> and uh, so the results of that then were that uh, the, the trial thing was five weeks and the jury came back and they, they came back with a $253 million verdict. We interviewed them six months later and they still remembered 
the opening statement and the images and the three anchor points six months later. Um, unfortunately for the other, the, the company, their, their uh, market cap dropped $5 billion the next day. Which you recover, you know, the whole thing was, you know, the verdict, he didn't end up paying that much, they didn't end up paying that much, but they settled out eventually. But this is really the power uh, of, a, of a presentation or a communication, you know, to be able to tell a story and then to distill down to its essence. Uh, these are techniques that, that, you know, we can use to start to, to thread a needle with the pyramid, that that can be a, a, a technique to, to really solve these sorts of problems of overwhelm. If this were the only slide we showed, yeah, definitely we're, we're overwhelming, contrasted with being able to pull out a very simple story and make it easy to understand for folks. So, uh, so with that, that's the one piece of advice is thread your, uh, thread your needle with the pyramid. And as you apply that, I want to, you know, in all those different circumstances you might use it, I want to wish you the best of luck as you unlock the power of your own visual stories. So, thank you. And, Well, if I'd like to make two points. Yep. One is in defense of bullet points and the standard canonical flight layout. When you're communicating complex information as opposed to an overview to a jury, there's a benefit in keeping the main points and the subordinate points persistently up front of the audience. And if the bullet points are short and they're not conflicting with the speakers, you know, commentary, it's useful to have that superstructure of ideas, you know, present as the uh, more complicated information is being developed. And the second point I'd like to make is the story structure that you're talking about. Uh, I mean, all communications have a problem solution structure, but it won't be as dramatic and as obvious as like your buyout story. If we ask uh, Donna and Victoria to apply the story structure to the slides that they you know, presented a little while ago. It wouldn't be such an obvious, um, dramatic arc to what they're doing. So I suggest that the story structure is going to be a harder fit for some presentations than for other presentations. Thank you. I have one question. Yep. I think what you did is really, really terrific because you're making the point that you can be simple without being simplistic. And that is something I think it's really challenging to get people. Do you have any suggestions for to, how to encourage people to, to do it that way? Um, because to me, it's most really people hard. think you're trying to be simplistic. And the main thing that I do is, so when, when I come into uh, an engagement with these attorneys, I'm coming in, they've been working on the case for sometimes years. And I think literally this is the neural pathways and you know, we're, we're just completely you know, wired now to understand things a certain way. And it's really hard to get out of that perspective. So what I do is come in with, you know, I'm like, hey, I'm a 12th grade, 12th grade educated juror. I don't understand that. What's that word again? And so just verbally, I'm coming in with a fresh perspective. So maybe that if you know, you're the content creator, bring in somebody else in the organization who's unfamiliar with the topic and having them interview you and ask you, what are the three main things you want from your audience? You, know, you want them to remember. So that verbal technique I found very powerful and effective just to have somebody fresh ask the, the three question to be able to pull that from the content. So, That's so much left. You bet. Thank you, Gary.